You're listening to Music Matters with Jason Tram. On this program, we feature interviews with distinguished members of the musical and performing arts community across multiple genres, from classical to contemporary, sacred to secular. We explore the most important issues affecting the arts today. Music Matters brings diverse innovators, ideas, and audiences together to create a broader musical community to inspire new solutions to unprecedented challenges. I'm Jason Tram, and I'm a classical music professional with over 25 years of experience as a conductor, music director, university professor, and now the host of Music Matters. These conversations with distinguished artists take you behind the curtain to explore artistic innovation under the most extreme conditions. Thank you for joining us today and check out our website at www.jasontram.net and that's jasontramm.net. Again, that's www.jasontram.net, T-R-A-M-M.net. Here you can explore our past 150 episodes and find a listing of our upcoming guests and topics. Also, be sure to join us on social media for more Music Matters content. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today's guest is one of America's great operatic sopranos, Jennifer Rowley, where she has performed to outstanding critical acclaim since her debut in 2015. Did you know you always wanted to be an artist? You know, no, I didn't. I um I actually come from a very sporty family. Um my father was a record holder in collegiate wrestling. Wow. Um, played football. My brother was a big football player for really big high schools in in Ohio and Michigan. Um and I was always involved in sports. Um not a lot of people know this about me, but I was an all-state softball player. Like, Congratulations. Wow. I was kind of awesome. <laughs> Were you a pitcher? Were you a, a really, field player? I was a I was a third baseman. Um and Important I was, defensive role. I had the big I had the big arm, you know. I got the um, cannon. <laughs> I had the cannon, yeah. And uh I was a really it was a it was a really fun childhood. I mean, we just we were constantly swimming or baseball or or football or I mean, you name it. We were always doing sports, and I danced a lot actually when I was when I was younger. My mom took me to dance when I was, God, like five, six. There's a there's an amazing picture floating around the internet somewhere of me at like five years old pushing a little baby carriage with my Cabbage Patch Kid in it Um, because we did a little song called Pretty Baby and like we had little babies. It was so cute. (laughs) It's around there somewhere with my big curly hair. Um, But so I danced for a really long time and that was really, I mean, I would say ballet classes is where I was first introduced to music and classical music. Um, I did a lot of choir, show choir, things like that coming up because I always could sing. Um, moving really and singing, sing. boy, that's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. I did not think though that moving and singing was a career. Do you know what I mean? Nor did I think that sports was a career for me, but like, <laughs> it was, you're the second the opera personality from Ohio to say the same thing. I didn't think music could be a career. That was Carly and Graham. Yeah. Who's uh, on a few weeks ago. She just took over at Manhattan school. Jennifer, how did you discover your operatic voice? You know, thankfully, I had a lot of really good mentors along the way. Um, I Feel free to to give us some shout outs. Oh, yeah, for sure. So I went to when I was um, when I was in the middle of high school. So between my sophomore and junior year, um, I my my mother got remarried. My father got remarried, too, but earlier. But my mother got remarried and she and my stepfather wanted to move to a different city where they were a little closer to family and things like that and so in the middle of high school I had to move and I had to go to a different school and the school district that I lived in did not have what I needed and she knew she knew from a young age what I needed and it it definitely like I needed to be in choir I needed to be in show choir in the theater program in those things she she could tell and uh, so she petitioned the city next door to us um, to allow me to go to high school in the in the district next door. Way to go, mom! Because yeah, 
Yeah, and they had a great choir. They had um, amazing speech and debate program. They had a theater program. They did musicals. They did all this stuff. And my mom was like, no, you have to go to this school. So she, she made that happen, which was amazing. And the choir director there, his name was Ted Williams, he, he heard right away what I had. And he said, you need to go, I mean, really, I sang for him one time, and he was like, you need to go get voice lessons. And I was like, I don't need no stinking voice lessons. <laughs> like, <laughs> who needs voice lessons, right? But he, he said, I'm going to call, and we lived really near Oberlin, Ohio. Wonderful. And uh, he was like, I'm going to call Oberlin, and I'm going to see if they have someone who could teach someone so young. And I was like, yeah, sure, okay, whatever. And my mother was, I mean, my parents were supportive to a point that if they, you know, if I really wanted to do something that they would help, you know, financially with that sort of thing. And so they, they did take care of, of having of me having like a weekly voice lesson. And what was really funny was the teacher that I got placed with at Oberlin was a, she was a um, graduate student at the time. She and I ended up at Indiana University together Amazing. at the same time in the same voice studio. She was doing her doctoral studies when I came in to do my master's studies. It was crazy. But she had taught me when I was like this big. That's <laughs> the really world funny. of opera, isn't it? They keep yeah, looking right. around. But she, they re she did really lead me and, and my choir director really did lead me in the path of like classical music and oratorio and opera and things like that. And so the roles that I was given in theater at that school were more legit roles. So I remember I did Irene in Hello, Dolly, the secondary character, and I did Hoddle in um, Fiddler on the Roof. And those are much more legit things, those on songs. The breath, they're right, they're more the lyrical, yeah. And I think that the choir director knew right away what I was supposed to be, and I just didn't know it yet, you know? Um, and so they gave me a lot of opportunity to do, I mean, I did like solos from Handel's Messiah and things like that on concerts, you know, for the choir. And, you know, I, I was given a lot of opportunity to sort of push me in the right direction. So when they said you should audition for college for like conservatory, I was like, what? <laughs> Because I didn't know, I didn't know that you could go sing Handel's Messiah and make money doing it, right? That wasn't part of my. I didn't grow up that way. I heard a very um, similar story from Sam Raimi as well. He's like, I didn't know you could <laughs> sing for money. <laughs> who yeah, knew? Like, what, I mean, how who knew you could do this? And uh, so I did do an. I did do several auditions for school, and I ended up at Baldwin Wallace, um, which is my alma mater in Ohio where I have an artist residency now, which I absolutely love. It's so much fun. Um, that, that must be so but, great to come home again. Oh, uh, it's amazing. And I, I literally work with every single student in the voice department. Every wow, single one. I, what a great I get to work with them twice a year. That's awesome. Um, but anyway, when I got there, I had a teacher named Keith Brodigan who also could hear right away what I was. And I, of course, thought I was there for musical theater. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that quickly changed because he was like, you're not, that's not your voice. And let, you know, I'm going to prove to you it's not your voice. And it, you know, it took a little bit, but he did prove to me that it wasn't my voice. And then, then I had to learn what the heck opera was, <laughs> you know? So it was, yeah, thankfully I had good teachers along the way that sort of led me in the right direction, even if I didn't believe that was the right direction. What advice do you have for dealing with rejection? Because that's such a, a huge part of uh, the singer's business is dealing with rejection, like, constantly. Yeah, it is a massive part of, of the business. It's massive. Um, I, I can't remember the singer I was talking to, uh, but when I was younger, I spoke to a, a soprano in my, voice t in my voice studio, and she told me she did um, a thousand auditions before she got a yes. And she start, she yes. ended up having to start very late in life and, and things like that. But, you know, you hear no so many times, you start to think it's you and it's not. Um, and the advice, the advice I give all my singers is that it is an aesthetic business. It is a business that everyone has their own kind of taste for everything, you know, and no one is going to be the next Kalas. I'm sorry, but no one is going to be. We had a Kalas. 
She enriched our art form. She left us with the most amazing recordings. And we learn from her. But there is no Kalas. She's gone. And if that's your taste, you know, and someone comes in and sings like Beverly Sills, you can't fight a person's ear. And so if what's in a person's ear is Kalas and you are more like Beverly Sills, you're not going to change that person's mind. And that's okay. And I, I really do, you know, I believe that we all have we all have something to offer. And when you go into an audition, when you go to sing a concert, when you go to do a performance, all you can offer is what you have. What you do best, what you have to give, who you are. You can't offer something you think they want. You don't know what they want. You have no idea what's inside of their head and what's in their ear and what recording they listen to that they prefer to whatever sound it is that you have you have no idea so all you can do is go in and present you that's it your voice your technique your musical style your ever your interpretation your looks your personality your smile everything it's just you and so you might as well go in and perform every single chance you get um and it's a very hard thing to do especially as a young singer it's very hard to just say okay i'm just gonna be me it takes a long time to develop that thick skin, too. And you never know. It does. Sometimes you sing an audition, and maybe they have a tenor who's taller in mind, or who knows what the, the parameters may be. But maybe they'll cast you down the road. That's absolutely right. And I, that has happened to me many times, where I went in for something, and a year later they called for something completely different because aesthetically what I went in for wasn't what they heard me as. And that's okay. Like, that's an okay thing. I, I love, I don't know if you know this, Jason, the um, the interview that Brian Cranston did. Ooh, after I love he, Brian Cranston. <laughs> oh, God, he's amazing. He did an interview, I mean, a, a passing interview after he won um, his Emmys for um, Breaking Bad. And someone, I think the actor's studio asked him in a, in a you know, just like a red carpet, carpet interview, asked him uh, for advice for, for young singers. And he was talking about that his life didn't start until he learned that every opportunity to go in front of someone is an opportunity to perform. And he says, strong. when I started, go so strong. And he says, when I started getting, when I started going into auditions and just performing, just giving what I had to give to the side that they gave me, that's when I got Breaking Bad. That's when I started to have immeasurable success. When I was trying to please everybody and prove something, I got nothing. And, and he was that, typecast as the goofy dad resonates. and Malcolm in the middle, sure. <laughs> yeah, and they, it resonates so hugely in our business as well, in musical theater and in opera, you just have to go in and take it as an opportunity to perform, show what it is that you do, what you have to offer to a production and to a role, and then you leave. And that's all you have control over. So if it's a no, you did your job that day, and that day something else, <laughs> something else was around that they wanted and you didn't fit that, and that's okay. But, I, I, you know, again, I had really good people leading me along the way. And I, I think you're talking about Kara Moore. Is that, am I, yeah, okay. I so, read those reviews. I said, this person is someone to watch. So Will Crutchfield was, uh, is an amazing, I don't even know, what, a genius, a mad scientist <laughs> for the voice. I don't know. I don't know what to call him, but he's an amazing person and, and really the, the genius that just kind of oozes from him just when you have a, a simple 30-minute coaching is is unbelievable. And I had gone in, so I was, I was 30. I was an old young artist, but a young artist nonetheless. And actually, I had management already, but I didn't have anything that summer, the, the summer of 2010. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to just audition for this program because I feel like 
it, first of all, I paid, so great. But second of all, I was like, I feel like I could learn a lot about bel canto music from Will. And, you know, I was really into like Lucia and Puritani and those kinds of things at the time. And so I was like, I feel, I feel like he's the guy I, I need to connect with. And so I went in and that summer they were doing Norma and they were doing Maria de Rouen. And I went in for to cover Norma. I had I had taken in Bellini, probably Puritani or something like that, and was like, I, I want to cover Norma. And he, I did the audition and I sang. And he said, you know, I have this. I know you want to cover Norma. I understand that. But I have this other role. And she's really interesting. And it's a bigger voice. It's a, it's more of a Roberto Devereux, Donizetti Queens type of role. It needs a little more meat through the middle voice, which you have. And I'd like to give you the cover of that. And I was like, okay, <laughs> like didn't listen to it. Didn't anything. He said Donizetti Queens. And I was like, I'm in. <laughs> so, so I learned it and it was, it was exactly as he said. It is an amazing piece of music, first of all. But second of all, it is a meteor thing. And after having learned Roberto Devereux uh, last last year, I they go, they're like hand in hand. They're they're really they're pretty beefy and they're dramatic. And yes, it takes a lot of really good coloratura, but the the legato line is different than Norma. It's very different. So I was covering. I was a young artist cover. And I prepared myself as I would for the professional world. I was fully learned, fully memorized, fully ready to go on day one. And that apparently was very surprising <laughs> to people. Amazing. <laughs> and when I went into my first coaching with Will, I remember him saying, well, you could actually do this role, couldn't you? And I was like, that's the plan. Important <laughs> like, of things to come. <laughs> you know, if... If if called up, you know, if you're a cover and if called upon, you want to be prepared to to do it, you know. Um, so it was we were coming up on the dress rehearsal morning, which was very early, and we were getting on the bus to go up to Caramore to do the dress rehearsal for Maria de Rohan, and I was going up to do a rehearsal for another concert, you know, like a pre Maria concert, um, where we would have introduced some songs and things like that, you know, as they did and in Caramore at the time. Um, and the stage manager pulls me aside and says, your colleague has canceled this morning's rehearsal. Are you prepared? And would you want to sing it? And I was like, heck yes, I want to sing it. <laughs> of wow. course I want to sing it. Like, you, and we had had no rehearsal. Like, we had coachings <laughs> and stuff, but we didn't have a cover. There was no such thing as a cover rehearsal. We didn't have that. So small companies don't learned... have those resources. Yep, no, you don't. Not and there. so <laughs> I had sat in that corner and watched and I learned all that blocking and I did it at home. You know, it wasn't staged, you know, at, at Karen where it was all semi staged in front of the orchestra, but still I knew when to cross, when to do, you know, all the things. And so I did the, the dress rehearsal and the, sang with the orchestra and I sang because I was like, when else am I going to get to sing Maria de Rohan with a period orchestra? I'm singing, right? So I sang and and I did all the blocking and everything because I, I felt like my colleagues would want that. And we get on the bus to go home and Rochelle Jonk gets on the bus and says, um, Jennifer, can you please come off the bus and go to the office? And I was like, what did I do? <laughs> like literally my brain went to, what did I do? Who did I hurt? Like, what's happening? Who died? Like, what happened? So I walk back to the back of the theater and all of the people are standing, all of the people from the festival are standing around in a, in a semicircle. And Lucy Yates, who I adore just so much in the world, she's an amazing Italian coach, is crying. And I was like, oh my God, somebody died. They're going to tell me somebody died. I'm going to have to get on the bus sobbing, crying, and Rochelle starts crying, and Will says, um, we would like you to sing the performance. Do you have a dress? <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I was like, what, what, what now? <laughs> like, what? And he was like, you have one day. Can you sing the performance? And I was like, well, yeah, like, I'll sing it. 
but no, I don't have a dress. <laughs> So that was um, that was an exciting uh, day, 24 hours, going through the score with Will the next day. Literally, they took me to Saks and bought me a dress because I didn't have one. And and really, I mean, they took great care of me. And then I went and I did it. And I woke up the next morning and my face was in every newspaper. And my phone I had a black. You remember the BlackBerry at the time? I do. <laughs> My phone was like just blowing up. up, just insane. And I, you know, I mean, I had slept. I slept probably. I mean, I remember sleeping really late that day, and I was like, "What is happening?" And my manager at the time called and said, "So you're going to be a star now?" And I was like, "Great." <laughs> <laughs> I did not make a professional debut, though, for two years after that happened. Really? Absolutely. Isn't that because amazing? Because it takes time. Because it takes time. And so people call it, you know, an overnight success that creates a star, but it takes time for that star to get in front of people. It's and great so, It's great PR to say that, but we all know it's not true. Because if you weren't the artist and had the preparation and all your years of dedication, it would be impossible to do that. I always say to young singers, right place, right time, and prepared. Exactly. Because you can be right place, right time, and sing like absolute garbage. And, and if you do yep. that, there's no, there's no star is born, you know? So tell us about your Metropolitan Opera debut. My first real, like, international, professional, widely viewed gig was in 2012, two years after this happened. My Met debut was not until 2014. Wow. So it takes a long time. And I was covering. I was covering at the Met. Um, Lenore Rosenberg was the casting director at the time, and she brought me in very quickly after, after um, Maria Jirohan to cover and so I was covering Desdemona and I was covering Musetta. I covered her once. I covered Guillaume Tell. I covered a lot of amazing things because she was like, we just need you in the, I need you in the house. I need people to get to know you. I need them very to know your smart. work ethic. Very, yeah. It's great to have very, you right there. But like I said, again, years, years of continual auditions, competitions, you know, to get, to get the international career going and it was it took a long time but you know it was so worth it in the end because the the voice was also allowed to develop and grow and mature and I it, I wasn't thrown into the deep end so quickly that I didn't have the technique to support it so it was it, it was a good it was a good path for me for sure for sure Take us backstage in your Met debut. You've put all this hard work and sacrifice and many years of training. Do you get nervous? What's your process? Oh, my God. So I don't know if you know this. When the Met does revival, the rehearsal process is this long. Like, <laughs> it's so short. And when I made my Met debut, I had four days of rehearsal Thankfully, I had covered Musetta, so I had covered it the, the, the fall prior, and I did it in the spring. But I did not get an orchestra rehearsal, and I had never been on the stage. And they said, places, and that was the first time I had sung with the orchestra or been on the stage was the places call for my Met debut. Wow. And it was crazy. <laughs> You walk on that crazy, gigantic stage, crazy. you sing Quando Men Vo. <laughs> you, and you don't even walk. You're pulled by a horse. <laughs> Amazing. Right? You're pulled in a carriage by a horse on the stage three feet away from the pit where you're afraid you're going to fall into. <laughs> you know? But it was, it was so, it was, it was so bananas. Because literally, you're just looking to see, oh, my God, there's a step there. There wasn't a step in the rehearsal room. <laughs> oh, there's a chair there. Oh, there's a, you know, oh, I actually have to climb on a table that's taller than the table in the rehearsal room. It was my, it was like, s separate your brain and your voice from the rest of your body and, like, let this walk and not fall and let this sing. <laughs> like, it was nuts. 
And the second performance was even crazier because the horse was making his Met debut <laughs> and he, he had stage fright. He had stage fright, the horse. And the horse got on stage about two feet, got the lights in his face and bucked and freaked oh. out and turned up stage to go away from the lights and the carriage was like tipping and I'm grabbing Phil Karinkos going, let's go. <laughs> and I jump out of the carriage, walk onto the stage, and I'm like, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no. <laughs> Music Matters with Jason Tram is produced by Mid-Atlantic Artistic Productions with Jason Tram as the host and executive producer and Quinton Tram as the producer and technical director. Music Matters has quickly become the fastest growing musical culture podcast on YouTube recently surpassing over 30,000 episode views and is pleased to join the roster of radio shows on WMCA, New York City. We hope that you can join us next week. Until then, keep music alive.